week in Love St. Albert and we had over 1,200 people join us for that festival and maybe you were part of it. It was just a fantastic time. It was a time for us as a church family to love our neighbors, to just serve them sacrificially and I hope you were a part of it. Thank you to those who served as part of it. We'll be doing it again next year on June the 8th and so I hope you'll mark your calendars and be part of it then because this is just a, a great time and uh, we get to love people like Jesus loved people. You know, as we uh, turn towards God's word, I've got a question for us to think about, and I think it's one that all of our dads probably will resonate with, but maybe not say that they resonate with. You know, it's one that I think many of us have, some of us vocalize it, but many of us just kind of live it out inside of us. It's this question, have you ever wondered if you're doing things the right way, right? We don't often talk about that, we often don't admit that. Sometimes as dads we wonder if we're doing things the right way. But I think all of us at one time or another have wondered this. When I turned 30, I decided to take up a hobby. I decided to learn how to golf. Now this was back in the days before TikTok and YouTube. Josh doesn't remember those days because like we're even around back then, but this was a long time ago, and so I didn't have TikTok to go to, I didn't have YouTube to go to to find these self-help videos, and so I did the next best thing. I went to Chapters, and I bought a book, Golf for Dummies, because that's literally what I am, Golf for Dummies, and uh, a reference for everybody else, but for Kirk, this is Golf for Dummies, and I began to pour over this book to study it and to learn all about golf. I started to watch PGA tournaments on Sunday afternoon, listening to the commentators describe Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods' swing and their putts and how they were doing it. I was learning all about it. I made it clear in the weeks leading up to my birthday that the only thing that would be acceptable for a birthday present was a set of clubs, and these are actually them. They are older than Josh as well. Uh, <laughs> not quite, not quite. But uh, the, So I made it clear to my wife, who loves me very much, that I wanted clubs because I wanted to learn how to play golf. And I took all of my expertise that I'd learned from watching the PGA, reading Golf for Dummies, and I began to go to the driving range, and I began to practice my swing, and, and it was going great. And then I decided, hey, maybe I should play a game for the first time. I had a buddy who was learning to play golf as well, so we went out to a course which quickly became my favorite course in Regina to play. And I remember getting out my clubs, getting up to that first tee. I set my ball up on the tee. I took a couple practice swings, and then I let it rip. Didn't get past the lady's tee. <laughs> my friend said, hey, why don't you take a mulligan? And I thought, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. See, we'd learned all the cool words to use when we're talking about golf. Mulligan just means do it again. And so I got up, and I put my new ball on the tee, and I took my practice swing, and I let it rip. This time, it got past the lady's tee but it didn't even break 100 yards. This was a 500 yard hole, and so I was in a lot of trouble. I remember walking with my clubs up to that first hole and wondering, am I doing this the right way? Because it seems so easy when Phil Mickelson does it. <laughs> but apparently, I can't get past the ladies' tee. Have you ever wondered if you're doing things the right way? And maybe during COVID, you started to learn how to do sourdough, right? Like everybody else watching the videos and you wondered, why isn't mine turning out like the ones on YouTube or TikTok? Or maybe you've done some home renovations, right? And you've watched all of the shows on HGTV or on YouTube and you've thought, why isn't my renovation looking like that? Or maybe you took up the game of golf and you've been wondering for years, why is it that I have so much trouble, am I doing it the right way? It happens, doesn't it? We have all feel this way at one time or another. We all wonder if we're doing things the right way. It even happens in our faith, that sometimes we can be following Jesus and we come to places like this, we hear people on stages like this talk about what it means to follow Jesus or we have a friend who's following Jesus and we think, my experience isn't like that. What I'm going through isn't like that. And we wonder, am I doing faith the right way? Uh, we are starting a new series today, and it's a three-week series, and over the next three weeks, we're gonna talk about some of the questions that often come up, about whether we're doing faith the right way. We're gonna talk about how do I receive the Spirit? We're gonna talk about how do I receive healing? And today, in our time together, we're gonna talk about how do I receive Jesus? How do I receive salvation? And no matter where you are in your journey of faith, there is something in this series for you. 
You see, if you're kicking the tires of faith, we're gonna talk about how is it that we journey on this faith journey? How do we walk with Jesus or apprentice with Jesus? And if you've been following Jesus for months or maybe decades, there's still something in this for you, especially when it comes to receiving Jesus because there is more of Jesus for you to experience. And today, in the time we have together, I wanna talk to you about how we receive Jesus, whether it's for the first time or whether it's for a new time, whether it's in an area of our life that we've never even considered before. And today, in the time we have together, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that receiving Jesus is all about repentance and belief. Receiving Jesus, that experiencing more intimacy with Jesus Beginning to your journey with Jesus, continuing your journey with Jesus is all about repentance and belief. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter one, verse 15. We're gonna look at just one verse today. We're gonna focus in, zoom in on it, because this verse holds an incredible secret that all of us need to know. Now, Mark 1, 15, it takes place in one of the accounts of Jesus' life. It takes place in probably what I think is the most action-packed a gospel or account of Jesus' life. It's 16 chapters long and, and Mark doesn't waste any time with really any kind of birth narrative or any other things. He just jumps right into Jesus doing things. Boom, boom, boom. In fact, the only part of the book of Mark that really is kind of slow moving is the first 14 verses. This is his introduction. But then verse 15 happens and if the first 14 verses are the introduction of who Jesus is, Verse 15 is the thesis. It is the mission, it is the why behind everything that Jesus does in the book of Mark. Verse 15 takes place after the the, uh, baptism of Jesus, after Jesus has spent 40 days in the wilderness meeting with his heavenly Father and preparing for what is to come. And then in verse 15, he arrives on the scene and it says this, in verse 14, John, uh, he says, Jesus went into Galilee And proclaiming the good news of Jesus, he said this, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. This is Jesus' mission statement. This is the thesis behind everything that happens. It occurs here in the book because what we see from verse 16 until chapter 16 of Mark is that everything Jesus does is motivated by revealing the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God that is near, that you and I can't see, but it's near enough to grasp. Everything Jesus does, when Jesus comes on the scene and he heals people of debilitating diseases, he heals people of infirmities that they've had since birth, when Jesus arrives on the scene and does that, he reveals the kingdom of God. When Jesus frees people from demonization, when Jesus frees people from addiction and and sinful, harmful behavior, Jesus is revealing the kingdom of God that is near. And when Jesus forgives sins, when Jesus restores relationships between God and humans and between people, between people who have been ostracized from their community, who have broken relationships with friends and family, when Jesus restores those relationships, he is revealing the kingdom of God. Everything in Mark hinges on this one verse. And the question you may have is, what is the kingdom of God? Jesus says the kingdom of God is near, so if if we wanna understand this verse, we have to understand what the kingdom of God is. And often when we hear the phrase kingdom of God, what immediately comes to mind is actually heaven. It is this point that when we die or when Jesus returns, which could be today or it could be years from now, that when Jesus comes, we will be with him and we live within the kingdom of God. That's often what we think of, but the kingdom of God is much more than that. It is all of that and more. The kingdom of God is where everything that sin is broken is made right. The kingdom of God is where all that sin has broken is redeemed, restored, and renewed. You see, when God created the heavens and the earth, when God created you and me, created humanity, he just pronounced it good. Now, when you and I think of the word good, it's like, that's just okay, right? Like if, if Josh has me over to his house for a meal and he says, Kirk, how do you like the food? And I say, it's good. That doesn't mean it's like Michelin star good, right? It just means, good try, Josh, right? 
It's true. That's what good means to us today, but when God says that all of creation is good, he's not just meaning like, yeah, nice try. It's like, this is perfect. This is different than anything you've ever experienced. This is holy. This is completely different than the world you see today. Everything about it is good. This is the world that God created. The problem is, is that sin entered the world and broke the world. Sin entered the world and broke relationships. Sin entered the world and broke you and me. And the kingdom of God is where all that sin has broken is redeemed, restored, and made new. That is the kingdom of God. And Jesus says that the kingdom of God is near. He's not saying it's off in some distant future. He's saying it's right here, it's right now. You may not realize it, you may not see it, but it is within your grasp. That the brokenness that you see when you turn on the TV, the kingdom of God is here. That God wants to change things right now. That the brokenness or the tension that, was in, that is within the relationships that you have, the kingdom of God is here. And you don't have to live in that tension. You don't have to live in that brokenness anymore. That God wants to redeem, renew, and restore your relationships. That the behaviors, the addictions, the things that you do that you don't want to do, that you don't have to live with that anymore. That the kingdom of God is within reach. And God wants you to experience this. And things can be different. The kingdom of God is where everything that sin has broken in your life, in my life, in our relationships with each other, with God, everything that sin has broken in the world is redeemed, restored, and renewed. Are you experiencing the kingdom of God in all of those areas in your life? Or is there something missing? Jesus says the kingdom of God is near, it's within your reach. He actually says this, he says the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. He says the time has come. Now in the New Testament there, there are two words associated with time. One is chronos, this is uh, kind of the root word of where we get the word chronometer which means your watch. This is the tick, tick, tick of time. This is calendar time. If someone asks you, hey do you have time for a coffee? This is the chronos, it means at some point in your week in all the things that you do, do you have a little space within that window to have coffee? That is chronos. It's an appointment at some point. Jesus is not using the word chronos in this context. He's using the other word. The other word is the word kairos. A kairos is a unique opportunity. It is a unique situation. It is a unique moment. And Jesus says the unique moment is now. And the kingdom is near right now in this moment. But he's not just talking about that moment in Galilee when he spoke those words. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God is right here and right now, waiting for you and me to reach out and embrace it. You see, right now is a kairos moment for you and for me. In fact, we have kairos moments all the time. The problem is, we don't realize it. I mean, if you're, if you're like me and you've been following Jesus for a long time, you've probably read the Gospel of Mark many times. I've read it many times and kind of blown right past verse 15 and just jumped right into the action of Mark. And we do the same thing with Kairos moments in our life. We don't even realize the secret that is in Mark 1.15. We blow right past it, just like we blow past the Kairos moments in our life. The moments when the kingdom of God is just waiting, it's within your reach, but you move past it because you're so busy or you're not paying attention to what is gone on in the day, in your life, in your week. The question is, what is a Kairos moment? How do we identify them? A Kairos moment takes place whenever you experience an extreme high or extreme low within your emotions. When you experience an ecstatic moment that is just so filled with joy, there is something that God wants to speak to you about in that moment. It is a Kairos moment where you can experience more of his vision for your life. When you experience an incredible low, or if you can experience an outburst of anger, 
These are moments when the kingdom of God is near and Jesus has something for you to see about the way life should be. You see, receiving Jesus begins with a Kairos moment. And it's about the highs and the lows. It's about the outbursts, the unexpected emotions that we have when we are consumed with emotions. But it's not just that. It also includes the moments that you experience over and over and over again. Has anybody ever had this experience where they say, why does this keep happening to me? Why do I keep finding myself in this situation? Why did all my relationships end up this way? That's a Kairos moment. Or maybe you've experienced this where you think, why did I do this again? Why do I do the things I don't wanna do? That's a Kairos moment. And we need to recognize these Kairos moments because in those moments, Jesus wants to reveal more of himself. He wants to reveal his vision for life. He wants to reveal the brokenness in you and me. And he wants to reveal how he can redeem, restore, and renew that brokenness in you and me. Have you experienced a Kairos moment? A Kairos moment is also one of these moments where we have this incredible discontent, where we see a problem in the world, where we see a problem in ourselves, where we see a problem in someone else, and we say, I just gotta do something about it, I need to help, I need to do something. These are Kairos moments, and Jesus wants to reveal something about his way of living and, what, and who he is, his heart for you, his heart for the people around you. Tell me, based on those statements, have you experienced a Kairos moment? This week, look back on the last seven days. Were there any extreme emotions that you felt? Highs, lows, outbursts. Times when tears are coming and you can't explain it. That's a Kairos moment that you experienced. Have you experienced some discontent? Absence of peace in your life? Have you had a moment where you say, why did I do that again? I, I said I wouldn't do that anymore. Why did I do it again? Have you experienced that? Jesus has something for you if you will recognize those kairos moments in your life. There's something of the kingdom that he wants to reveal. Jesus says that the keys to the kingdom begin with kairos moments and involve repentance and belief. He says the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. These are two actions that we need to engage with. If I say the word repent, what comes to your mind? For me, when I hear the word repent, I think, oh, that's where I make a list of all the things that I've done wrong and I speak them out to someone. It's about confession. I often associate repentance with confession. And while repentance includes confession, it is much more than that. The word that Jesus uses here is the word metanoia in Greek. The word metanoia, this is where we get the word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is when a caterpillar, right, goes into a cocoon and becomes this beautiful butterfly, something completely different. That is the heart of repentance. Repentance is about change. It is about changing the way you see the world. It is about changing the way you see yourself. It is about changing the way you see others. It is about changing your heart. Repentance involves confession, but that is not the first part. The first part is where we begin to realize the problems, the brokenness, the sin in our life. You see, to repent is to admit you are powerless over the sin and brokenness in your life. We don't often do this. In our hub program, which meets every week at seven o'clock and, and has support and recovery groups, this is actually one of the first things we teach, is that you are powerless over your addiction. You are powerless over your brokenness. You are powerless over your sin. You're powerless. We don't like to admit that because we believe we are masters of our own destiny, that we control everything. But the reality is, is that you have sin in your life that the argument you had with your spouse or the argument you had with your friend, the way you feel about something that was said, the way you did that thing or the way that something happened to you, all of the problems that you see when you turn on the news or read, go to your favorite news site, all of these problems are caused by sin. Some of them are very small and some of them are very large. Often we just describe them as character defects. But the reality is it's sin and it, you're powerless to it. 
You have no control over it. It controls you. In fact, you know, this idea of why do I do the things I, I don't wanna do? I, I, someone wrote that a long time ago, a guy by the name of Paul, he said this. He said, why do I do the things I don't wanna do? Whenever I wanna do good, I do bad, and when I wanna do good, I still do bad. It's like there's something alive within me. And he goes on to say in Romans, he says, that actually it's the truth. There's something alive in me, it's called sin. And we have to come to this place in repentance where we admit that we are powerless to the sin, whether it is big or whether it is small. But that's only the first step in repentance. The second step is that we admit that only Jesus can redeem, restore, and renew. That we are powerless, but Jesus is powerful. And this is actually the second thing that we teach in our support and recovery groups at the Hub is that you are powerless to your addiction, to your brokenness, to the sin in your life, but Jesus is powerful and that he can make a difference. And you see, this is the change that needs to take place in our hearts and in our mind. You see, in our minds, we need to come to this place where we realize, actually, I can't fix this myself. That the problems within me, the problems within my relationships, the problems in the world, that I cannot fix them. And that nobody else around me can fix them, only Jesus can. And we have to come to this place where we realize it. And when we come to that place where we realize that we are powerless to our sin and that Jesus is the powerful one, then we confess. <laughs> to confess is to articulate that which was in your heart and within your mind. That's what confession is. We confess, we tell someone, I'm powerless. Friends, I am powerless to sin. But Jesus has redeemed, restored, and renewed my life. And this is the starting point to experience the kingdom of God. And when we come to a Kairos moment where we recognize that there's something going on within us, that Jesus has something to restore, we need to come to this place, whether it's the first time we believe or whether it's the hundredth time, where we recognize that Jesus has more of the kingdom for us. And in order for me to experience, I have to confess again that I'm powerless and he is powerful. Jesus says the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And see, we repent, we believe we are powerless, we believe Jesus is powerful, we confess this, and often in the midst of that confession, we actually will list the things that we are powerless to. We call that confessing our sins. And then the next step is to actually believe. Now, when you hear the word believe, what do you think of? Often when we hear the word believe, especially as 21st century people, we think of, you know, I, I know it up here and I trust it. For example, you know, I was talking with someone this morning about this game that was on last night. I don't know if you know about the game that was on last night, <laughs> right? I was talking with him about this game and uh, we were talking about it and he goes, oh, I believe we can do it, but we're probably gonna lose it in the sixth. <laughs> I said, that's not actually belief. He goes, oh no, I believe it. You know, you just told me they're gonna lose it in the six, but you believe that they can do it, that they believe that they can win the cup. That's not belief. That's 21st century belief. You see, often when we think of belief as 21st century people, we think about mental assent, we know it up here, and we trust that it might happen, right? We trust that McDavid and Dreisaitl and all the gang will do their best to win the cup. We know they're the best up here. We're trusting that they'll actually do what they say they're gonna do, but we don't actually believe. When Jesus talks about belief, it's different. It's not about mental assent. It includes mental assent. It's not just about trusting. It includes trusting. But it is acting based on what you know, trusting in what you know is going on, and acting based on that knowledge and that trust. So, for example, if you really believe that our team will win the cup, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna go out and you're gonna buy a jersey. You're gonna spend 200 bucks on a jersey, right? You're going to go and buy playoff tickets. You're gonna go and buy a plane ticket to go down to Florida. You're going to paint your body blue, <laughs> don your jersey and pants, and put on an orange wig. <laughs> then you're gonna to go to this game and you're gonna cheer. Think about how much that costs, right? 
to get a game to the, ticket to the game, to get a plane ticket, to take time off work, to make rearrange your whole life around your belief that the Oilers will win the Stanley Cup. Now tell me, do you have belief? Anybody going to Florida this week? Do you have belief? No, Josh, you can't have the time off. <laughs> do you have belief? The way Jesus talks about belief. To believe is to reorientate your whole life around what you know and what you trust. And it is to act according to that. In fact, we say that to believe is to act based on God's will, not your own. And this is the third step that we teach in our support and recovery groups at the Hub. That you are powerless to sin, but Jesus is powerful. And that if you will surrender to his will, you can experience profound and lasting life change. And you think, oh, that's great for addicts, but I'm not one of those. Friends, you actually are. Because sin is an addiction at its very heart. And all of us do the things we don't wanna do, like there's something alive within us. And we have to come to this place where we repent, we confess that we are powerless to the sin in our life, the brokenness that we have that only Jesus is powerful. And then we need to submit our wills to his. A guy in the Old Testament named Paul, he wrote these words. He said, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works. Do you hear that? For it is God who works. Continue to, you continue to work out your salvation. You continue to repent. You continue to believe. But it is God who works within you. See, as we submit our will to Jesus, what happens is he begins to work within us to make it possible for us to experience the kingdom of God right here and right now. Continue to work out your salvation for it is God who acts, who, who acts within us so that we can fulfill and see the kingdom of God right here and right now. And this means that whether you're kicking the tires of faith or whether you've been following Jesus your whole life, that there is more of the kingdom of God for you to experience. Continue to work out your salvation. There are kairos moments that you're blowing right past. And Jesus, who is gracious, will keep taking us to those kairos moments again and again and again. He'll keep taking you to them. Why? Because he wants you to experience his kingdom. So when you ask, why does this keep happening to me? It's because Jesus has something he wants to reveal to you about his kingdom in those moments. So pay attention. And in the Kairos moment, say, Jesus, what do you want me to repent of? What do you want me to change the way that I see myself, to see the people around me, to see the world, to see you? How do you want me to see it differently? Jesus, well, how do you want me to act based on that change of view, that change of heart, that change of direction? Jesus, what do you want me to do? Because the kingdom of God is waiting for you and for me. You see, to believe is to submit your life to the rule and reign of Jesus. That's what it is to believe. If you wanna receive more of Jesus, you have to submit to the rule and reign of Jesus in your life. We don't like the idea of rule and reign, right? Like who wants to be ruled over? Who wants to be reigned over, right? I mean, when we talk about the British monarchy, we say, well, that's not really our king, right? Like that's just, he's just a figurehead. Jesus is no figurehead. If you wanna receive Jesus today, you have to submit to the rule and reign of Jesus in your life, in every area of your life. And there are parts, you will be doing this for the rest of your life. An author by the name of Gordon MacDonald, he once said that in every decade of our life, there's a question that we come up against where we have to decide, do we still trust Jesus in this area? It could be about your identity. It could be about who you are going to do life with. It could be, I don't know. But every decade of your life, you're gonna to come to this place where Jesus says the kingdom of God is right here, right here, and now will you repent and believe? And you have a choice. If you repent and believe, you experience the kingdom of God, and if you don't, you walk away. You see, this repentance and belief that Jesus talks about is not a one and done kind of thing. It is something we experience every day. I had one just the other day. I was holding my little newborn grandson, feeding him. And I had this Kairos moment as I was filled with joy. And Jesus revealed something of his heart for me about who he is. 
I had another Kairos moment when I got frustrated with my wife. And there was a moment where I'm like, oh Jesus, there's so much brokenness in me, I know that that's where this argument originates from. I want the kingdom of God, I want a marriage the way that you envision Jesus. You see, there's Kairos moments all the time, friends, if we'll just pay attention to them. So how do we respond to what we've heard today? Well, I've got two questions. One is for, pe- for the first group, is for people who are kind of kicking the tires of faith, they're just new to church, maybe you've never really heard about Jesus, and my question for you is, have you received Jesus? This is a Kairos moment, where you've heard about the kingdom and what it can give you. How all the brokenness that you experience that Jesus wants to redeem, restore, and renew, so that you can begin to live differently. Have you received Jesus? You begin to receive Jesus by recognizing that you are powerless to sin. But Jesus is powerful. And he wants to redeem, restore, and renew your life. It comes to this place where you receive Jesus by confessing that you are powerless and Jesus is powerful. And you can do this through prayer. Often when we pray, we begin to just say, Jesus, I recognize that I am powerless over this thing that is this brokenness that's within me. But you are powerful, and I submit to your rule and reign. That's what it means to confess. Sometimes we will list out all of the sins because it helps us to recognize the things that we are powerless to. And that's what it means to begin to follow Jesus, to receive him. And maybe you need to do that today. The person you came with can help you. Or maybe come up and talk with me and Josh afterwards. We'd love to help you begin to walk in the way of Jesus. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time. My question for you is different. It's, are you recognizing the Kairos moments in your life? Are you continuing to respond to the Kairos moments in your life, the time when the kingdom of God is waiting to break into the brokenness in your life? Are you paying attention to that? And are you repenting? And are you believing? All of us today have something that we need to repent and believe. The kingdom of God is near. The kairos is now. How will you respond? What might life be like if you actually responded by repenting and believing today? I wanna invite you to stand with us and sing our closing song.